Hurricane season sailing is what out of two to three thousand liverboards in their boats here in the Caribbean do every single year. And it's not just liverboards from all over the world, it's local people with their boats who still go sailing for weekends. As are people like me who live in Europe or the States or Canada and return to the Caribbean and their boats whilst the hurricane season is still alive and kicking. The people who live in the islands, keep their boats in the marinas for all of the summer, go sailing at weekends or for holidays throughout the year. Perhaps not the same intensity, but certainly sailing doesn't shut down for the hurricane season out here. The fact is that not every island is hit by a hurricane every year. Mainly there are just rain-intensive tropical storms. For the most part, hurricanes form out in the Atlantic to the east of Trinidad and Grenada and then curve northwards towards the Bahamas and the east coast of the USA. Most of them do not even get close to the island chain. With modern meteorological and technological advances, watching them approach the islands and develop on YouTube web meteo channels like Mr. Weatherman, who specializes in the Caribbean weather systems, makes it much easier than it was when I was last out here. For the two or three thousand odd liverboards on anchor up and down the Caribbean, it's easy for them to decide whether they should haul the pick and find a safer spot. Normally, there is at least five days warning before the hurricane arrives, and the cone, um, the intense part of the system, is probably only going to be 70 or 80 miles wide at the most. People like me who keep their boats in a safe marina, like here in the Caribbean, clearly can't move them if there's a hurricane approaching. I'm stern too, in a hurricane hole marina with mangroves on three sides, and the pontoons are held in place by oversized, very tall piles. I pay a company to look after my boat, who will haul the boat further out so that the surge won't cause her stern to hit the pontoon. Whilst I was back in Europe last summer, I received weekly emails from the company about the state of the boat. They opened up the hatches um, and they checked the bilges and they checked the battery levels and they made sure that there was a clean flow of air through the boat once a week. They would send me pictures of her inside, um, out of which uh, that certainly gave me a feel-good factor despite being nearly 3,000 miles away in northern France, drinking red wine on my balcony under the summer sun. Frankly, if I was on board and Hurricane did have a direct hit on this marina, I would get off the boat and go to the local bar and keep my fingers crossed uh, with my passport and my credit cards in my pocket. Which isn't what we did when there was notice of a storm hitting the 3,000 boat marina in La Rochelle on the west coast of France some time back. The Capitainery got in touch with all the liverboards and took them into the port office. But as we weren't a liverboard and we just lived nearby, they didn't inform us. At the last minute, we decided to go home. The 100 mile an hour winds brought down power lines and trees and almost every boat in the marina suffered some damage and seven actually sank. The mega problem was that the swell and the waves hitting the pontoons lifted them over the top of the piles and they then crashed down onto the boats. Our pontoon was badly damaged and if we'd tried to use it to get off the boat during the storm, I think we'd have died. Pawpaw, our Westerly Ocean 43, got away with a bent pulpit. We were really lucky. What I had forgotten about weather in the hurricane season, which is also described as the rainy season, is that it appears to be two or three degrees warmer at noon and it feels much more humid. And it rains a lot, for maybe days on end. I sat in the boat for about a week as system after system went through. It didn't rain all day, there will always be dry spells and in the end far more dry days than rainy days, but nonetheless it certainly did rain. The rain is warm. And if I'm far from land sailing, I just take my clothes off and pop them in the cabin to keep dry. It's not a pretty sight, it's certainly not clickbait, but it's lovely to have a fresh water shower and be able to wash my hair. In my recent hurricane season sailing, 
I was heading out of Apricot Marina near Fort de France to head back here when it rained on me as I was leaving my berth. By the time I got to the fuel pontoon, my shorts looked as if I'd been severely frightened. But frankly, it's so warm it doesn't really matter if your clothes get wet as they dry within a few minutes once the rain stops and the sun comes out. The cost of a litre of diesel here is 85 cents, which equates to about 70p per litre, I think, in UK prices. The prices are exactly the same at every fuel dock throughout all the French Caribbean islands. There's a law about this, so there's no point in trying to shop around. My fee at Apricot Marina, including electricity, was 11 euros a day, which equates to about £9.50 a day. You notice I say day, which is because they charge by the day you arrive and they include the day you depart, not 24 hours or overnights like a hotel. I arrived on Monday afternoon and left early on Thursday morning, three nights. So I was charged for four days stay. A little sharp practice perhaps, but I think I've encountered the same in the UK and Channel Islands very, very occasionally. And frankly, at 11 euros a night, it's, it's not worth bothering about. Probably won't go back there, but they have 20 or so mooring boys outside the marina, which is useful if the nearby Fort de France anchorage is too crowded. I got back on board Golden Haze in September, after some six months away, and found her in a good state. Took a couple or three days to acclimatise to the higher temperatures of around 34 or 35 degrees at noon, but at night, the temperature would drop enough for me to want to pull a sheet over myself. I was busy with a few bits of maintenance, like getting a cover made to go over the boom between the bimini and the spray hood so I could keep the sun out and keep the cockpit dry. New pump for the lavac that was proof how easy it was to get boat stuff here. And work, um, I could have had somebody fitted if I'd wanted very easily compared to when I was last here some 20 years ago. There's a large chandler at the end of the main pontoon here, a branch of Pochon, the electronics company, and there's hood cell makers almost next door to it, as well as rigging and refrigeration specialists and four other chandlers just down the road. So, having fixed a few things, waited for a gap in the rainstorms, I called the port office on VJHF to say I was leaving for a few days as I slipped out of my berth. A marinero in his boat turned up to see if I needed assistance and this is part of the deal, a service I would never have experienced in the UK. My neighbours, uh, Norbert and Patricia, were actually able to give me a hand but it was nice that the marineros were keen to help. Not sure about you but I find stern to mooring and unmooring as a bit of an effort. I've offered to keep permanent mooring lines fixed onto the pontoon and I've got a couple of bumpers on the dock to help protect them in case I get it wrong. I got them over 15 years ago in Gibraltar and I've hung on to them through various boats and marinas. It was interesting seeing all the boats that were enduring the hurricane season on their mooring buoys and anchored off. Further out at anchor was a DYT submersible yacht transport boat and loading some mega boats which had finished the Mediterranean season and were out here in the sunshine while the Europe Mediterranean shivers. I must say it was a pretty smart and well kept ship and I can see why many people prefer to say pay a bit more to use them. The bad news for me was all the super yachts were lining up at the fuel dock to bunker with their local diesel at 80 cents and I wanted to fill up my tank. This meant I had to head out with not much diesel and no alternative but to sail. On the leeward side of the islands the winds generally a pleasant 10 to 15 knots and I sailed away happily under just the Genoa. Through the gap between Diamond Rock and the mainland then I continued the 20 odd mile passage to the anchorage of Fort de France. The almost new Raymarine autopilot packed in, so I ended up helming nearly all the way there and all the way back a few days later. 
it's a design issue, particularly connected to Benetos, who have the ability to fold the steering wheel to one side to make access from the stern past the wheel into the cockpit and the cabin easier. The power connection into the little electric motor is a long waterproof special plug which knocks itself on the throttle control casing. It's just a problem which I think I've solved by removing most of the plug and wrapping the joint with amalgamating tape. I can't see another solution if I want to be able to stow the wheel. But actually that's part of the joy I'm experiencing out here again. The sailing between any of the islands is gentle and you're never far from a secure anchorage. Between the islands, oh, I can be a bit blustery and you need to watch the weather forecast, but you can always see the outline of the next island on the horizon. So when I got to Fort de France uh, and found that the anchorage was totally taken over by the Jacques Fabre two-handed Atlantic race, the Port Authority had put out a line of yellow buoys between the shore and the anchoring area, making it impossible to anchor in less than 30 metres. So I gave that up and I went a few miles further into the bay to Apricot Marina, which I wanted to see anyway as it's closer to the airport and near to the capital, Fort de France. It's not for me. A bit like Eastbourne Marina, it was created to make the surrounding apartment blocks have an attractive view. Despite like Eastbourne having some nice shoreside restaurants serving terrific food, it's a little bit scruffy. What really concerned me was that the exterior piles were substantial, but the inside piles holding the pontoons were only five feet out of the water. And if a hurricane did hit Martinique, then I reckon very few of the apricot boats would survive it. I had a lovely sail under the Jenny back around the coast, uh, passing dozens and dozens of Liverpool sailboats from all over the world, anchored up in the 20 or so bays between Fort de France and Diamond Rock. I never realised how many Americans, Canadians and Europeans had discovered that the wonderful free anchorages, the cheap food, the cheap fuel and f almost free water was a wonderful way to enjoy retirement out here on a very, very modest budget. From Diamond Rock back to Le Marin, the trade winds are nearly always on the nose and the 20 to 30 knots was a bit of a challenge for my little 18 horsepower engine. I was lucky to make three to four knots for the hour or so it took me to get back into the bay that houses Le Marin. I stopped before getting into the marina area to put on the fenders as without the autopilot working I just had to heave to and drift whilst I did this work. Motored down the hundred or so boats on the boys, many of whom which were unoccupied as their owners were back in the States or Europe and they're looked after as well by the companies that look after Golden A's here in the marina. I announced my return on BHF to the marina office and a little later a marinero arrived in his boat to help me. My kind neighbours Norbert and Patricia to windward in their 40-foot steel boat Anio Aurora helped and it didn't rain but I did manage to sweat a little. They're new to sailing and it's their first boat and they've got a Facebook page called Voilier Aqua Aura. Where they describe their trials and tribulations as well as their firsts. Well, so far, so good. What I found out is that you can spend 12 months of the year on board here in the Caribbean if you want. I'm getting more use in nicer weather out of my boat than I was in the UK Channel waters. On the downside there are issues with insurance, getting non-standard spares for the boat and international and local communications, not with the, notwithstanding the arrival of Starlink which I'll talk about in the next video.
probably. Anyway, fair winds. Bye. My library of digital sailing books is at gentlesailing.com, so you can buy them as instant downloads. There's a link to a printer who can convert them to hard copy if that's what you prefer. I've just totally updated and republished French Canal Routes to the Mediterranean, which is now in its 12th edition and is fully up to date with new information, charts and pictures. Recently I published Your Boat in the Sun, which proved an instant popular success. It's about where to keep your boat in the Mediterranean or the Caribbean and the costs and the logistics involved. I sold 50 copies on the very first day. The Atlantic Crossing Guide has become a bestseller and it outsells most of the others, probably because it's arguably one of the most comprehensive guides to sailing to the Caribbean that's available. The Gentle Sailing Route to the Mediterranean is one of the most popular publications that I have. It describes how to coast hop all the way to Gibraltar without having to spend a night at sea. There are books about marinas in the Med, sailing in the Caribbean islands, as well as a book on simple navigation and even a Pacific Ocean crossing guide um, and a book about just living aboard a sailing boat. Anyway, it's all at gentlesailing.com. So please do pay the site a visit and browse through my publications if you have a moment. Thanks. Fair winds.